we'll uh, we'll get our head and try and introduce our panel. And I've got some discussion points and some of the questions I've kept up as general themes um, to kind of attack with that. So first, can I get my panel to maybe activate their cameras? <laughs> uh, and I'm going to do say you've met, met many of the panel so far. Uh, Dr. Feldgar at NCBI, Dr. Sang at LSHDM, uh, Inez Mendez at, U at uh, University of Lisbon and in Molecular Medicine, Dr. Andrew Page at the Quadram Institute, um, Dr. Emma Griffiths at Simon Fraser University, Dr. Carolyn Johnson at uh, JPIAMR, Professor Mark Palin, are you? Are you what? I don't actually know your current affiliation, Mark. You can jump in on that if you wish. <laughs> Um, uh, I'm at the University of East Anglia on the Quadrum Institute. Ah, good, good. Didn't want to, didn't want to class dispersions by giving you the wrong, <laughs> wrong affiliation. Um, uh, Professor Hank, Deba Hank Denbacher at the University of Georgia, and Dr. Anthony Underwood at the Center for Genomic Surveillance, Center for Genomic Pathogen Surveillance. Um, so there, yeah, that well, that welcome. Thank you all for attending. Um, so yeah. A few discussion points, and I think we'll take the approach of I will throw out the questions and feel free to jump in or put up your hand to uh, take your tackle on. And I will be picking on some of you, especially with when I ask the question. So I think one of the themes that came up today, and we did provide some answers to it. Okay, I have AMR Genomics. Which database and tool do I use? How do I know which one to use? I'm starting with the easy questions. Okay, uh, Anthony, you jump in. <laughs> I, 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 mean, I think it's almost an impossible question to, to answer. And in the project I was involved with, I thought long and hard about which database to use. And at the time, this was about three years ago, I actually ended up having a bit of a hybrid solution where I, I took the acquired database from NCBI. And at the time, the, the point mutations weren't as well represented in the NCBI database. So I took the point finder database from, from the ResFinder crew and basically wrap them up and use the Reba software to merge those, those things together. Um, and I still, to be honest, find myself in a very similar situation today, is that each of the databases has their own benefits. Um, you know, each of them, ha some have better metadata. ResFinder, for example, tries to um, have a sort of um, in silica anti-biogram. NCBI has really nice release schedules, um, which I really appreciate, and really well-described releases. And so I find it, I still find that actually often the best thing to do is to run several databases you know, with your favorite tool or with a tool which, which uses that database and to compare some of those outputs. Um, I still don't find there's one database to rule them all, unfortunately. Um, so I think a question, unless anyone else wants to jump in on that one, uh, apart from uh, harmonization is one way of comparing and charmed as Inez talked about. Um, why are the bit why are why are all the databases just the little beta lactamase genes? <laughs> oh, I can I'll, I'll jump in if that's okay. Yeah. Um, so that that there's I mean one reason is that they were uh, if you go back to the eighties there is actually the same kind of crisis we have now, which is the existing beta lactamases were all failing. Um, so there's been a lot of work put into that. The other thing is this is. If you're familiar with beta lactamase nomenclature, you'll see things that are like, you know, TEM1, TEM2, right, and so on. That was actually intentionally designed. George Jacoby told me before he resigned, before he retired, that they gave those names rather than just calling it, you know, another class A or another class C beta lactamase, because they actually wanted people to have an incentive by giving it a somewhat sexy, at least for biologists, name to get it published. Um, because, and, and the goal was if you did that, then people would have an incentive to do the biochemical characterization. So there's actually a large community, I think both in terms of the drug development side, they're, they're effective antibiotics, they're well tolerated, as well as just, there was some sort of conscious, subtle efforts to build a community of researchers who know each other. Um, and so that's sort of taken off. I, if that, that's my take on it. Those, those two, um. And also because these are curated by, the, they used to be curated by Leahy, now it's curated by NCBI at their request. Um, those are sort of, once you have that, people will submit 
and so you get that information. I guess it's if you build, if you build it, they will come kind of thing. So that's my take on it, but. Yeah, great. Um, yeah, and uh, in some ways, I think the other aspect is, it's one of the more obvious types of, beta, of AMR resistance. It's, it has a clear it has a clear mechanism. It destroys a beta lactam. It's easy to follow in that respect. Whereas when you're getting to more nuanced bits of target protection or target modification, like uh, it becomes less obvious. So we're we're better at studying it as well. I would say. Um, and I'm gonna okay. I'm gonna target Kara for this one um, as they have a lot of expertise in this particular problem. How far can we push AMR prediction of phenotype from genomes? There's lots of statistical models. There's supervised machine learning. How far do you think we can push them? And do you think, you know, do you think there's limits to what we can actually do with that? Yeah. So um, this is another challenging question that I don't necessarily have the answer to. But um, we have done sort of rules-based methods, um, statistical modeling, and machine learning methods to try and predict um, AMR phenotypes. And we have found that, um, you know, for some things like E. coli statistical modeling, like logistics regression work quite well for predicting phenotypes, but then for other species like Pseudomonas aeruginosa it becomes much more difficult and very, very complex. And so I don't really have an answer for how to progress our prediction ability for Pseudomonas aeruginosa. I'm not sure if there is a machine learning algorithm that can really learn all those complex mechanisms, but hopefully time will tell and with more work and uh, like uh, the mechanism elucidation being done, we can sort of push towards that. But um, yeah, so there is no right answer. And then for some organisms like Klebsiella that we're working on now, we're thinking that maybe a rules-based method could work. And so that's like on the simpler end of things. So, yeah. Uh, do you think there's a, pr the, the getting a good prediction of phenotype isn't necessarily always the end goal. Is there something, do you think there's utility in just making some of these models, try and learn more about the mechanisms? Yeah, so what we've shown in our work is that sometimes um, we can find new phenotypes for already known resistance genes. Um, so we find, uh, we look into the models and then we find which are the strongest predictors. And then we uh, phenotypically test them uh, using um, experimental validation. And then we found that, um, these known resistance genes actually have phenotypes that we wouldn't necessarily expect or haven't been published before. And so I think that it is still a useful exercise to see which mechanisms are really driving their resistance, underlying resistance of these bugs. Great. Anyone else want to jump in on that? Or I think it was pretty comprehensive, uh, comprehensively covered. Um, Okay, what about AMR genomics of difficult aspects? Do we tend to just ignore repeats and mobile genetic elements when we can't assemble them very well? Are there any bioinformatics tools that are better suited to dealing with them in relation to AMR? Andrew, you're nodding and shaking your head. That means you're volunteering. Yeah, I think fundamentally, you know, if you were using short reads to look at, a, you know, highly repetitive AMR genes, you know, where they've come in repeatedly over and over again in the same place, you know, that's a technological limitation and you just need to use a different technology. You have to use longer reads. But that is one of the great things about, say, Nanopore Pack Bio, that we are being able to explore these things. We're not just seeing, you know, massive copy numbers and, and you know, collapsed repeats and missing all, all the information that is in there, you know. Is it 10 copies? Is it five copies? Who's to know? So uh, yeah, long read metagenomics really will help. Well, sorry, long read sequencing of isolates will help and long read metagenomics will help even more. Um, so I think you have to use the right tool for the right job and there's no point in just messing around trying to, you know, make a round peg fit in a square hole kind of thing or probably got that the wrong way around. But um, yeah, so bioinformatics can only do so much. So on that topic, what are the tools for doing AMR analysis from long reads? We need to invent them, more or less, you know? I think a lot of people just take tools for short reads or for assemblies and then try and apply them. Um, but of course, you know, at the moment you've got errors in particularly in, in just raw packed bio data, um, which need to be taken into account because, you know, like if, if you have a single SNP or, or a partial gene, is that really, 
there or not you know is that a function or not you know unless you have the actual phenotypic data to back it up you don't really know and then of course there's all the other um resistances where we don't we can't explain it or intermediate like i i absolutely hate when someone says intermediate you know uh but they don't tell you you know what the what the mic is or whatever and then you just you're you're lost at that point that's always the Always the inevitably the tension in uh, bioinformatics and life sciences in general is newer technologies give us the prospect of getting better answers, but we haven't written the tools to use that new data very well yet. I think we just need an army of bioinformaticians employed for the next 10 years to write all these tools. And maybe some of the attendees here can be a part of that group. Um, so, but okay, there are a lot of different tools and approaches. And one of the biggest things they vary in is sensitivity. So can they detect anything that even looks like an AMR gene? Do they capture all of the AMR genes that we know about in that sample? Or specificity? Do they capture, you know, are the ones they capture actually AMR genes? So on one end, we have highly specific things that people talk about, like PCR, where we're well, hopefully, if the primers are designed well, very specific in identifying, okay, we found this one particular beta-lactamase that we designed primers for, we got that out. On the other hand, we have potentially sensitive methods like metagenomics that can look at all, potentially all the AMR genes in the entire ecosystem with sufficient depth and lots of caveats. Like how do you choose, what, how do you choose based on your particular domain where to land on that sensitivity and specificity spectrum? Come on, I know some of you work with, especially with public health and uh, oh. some of the questions about this. Yeah, just uh, go ahead, please. Uh, just a quick, I mean, our approach, because we actually work with other US agencies um, that are involved in public health and surveillance. So we are, we are typically very cautious. Um, we try to err on the side of conserve, being conservative in terms of or at least if we're going to say, well, this gene was only hit with, let's say, an HMM, that we make it clear to the user that that's the case. So we, we err on that side um, because it's, we're not really looking at gene discovery. You know, we're not trying to do, uh, you know, here's this novel gene from this organism. We're really trying to help them make some very specific uh, uh, decisions about uh, even regulatory issues or, you know, is this a problem, that kind of thing. So we're, we're somewhat conservative on that, on that, in that sense. I guess another huge problem is that we're highly biased in what we do. You know, we just look at, you know, these human pathogens, which cause disease. And I know those that are, and sometimes animals, but they, the, I know these are the ones that people target with uh, antimicrobials. But there is antimicrobials out there everywhere, you know, in the soil, if you look at bacteria there, whatever. And we're missing so much of the actual knowledge um, because we're only targeting, you know, pathogens, which make up a teeny tiny bit of uh, what's actually out there in the environment and the real world. So I think we do need to go on a big fishing expedition and uh, stamp collecting and look at more than just uh, pathogens which cause serious disease, you know, because at, well, at one point it wasn't, half of NCBI, just uh, E. coli K12, well, might be on back a bit, but, uh, you know, unfortunately, when you, when you have things that are so biased, it uh, can overwhelm databases, you know, when you're like, say, Salmonella, you know, there's so much work, say, done on some of Typhi, which is MDR and whatever, but then, you know, what happens when you look at a different Salmonella, you know, are we missing things in uh, Salmonella that doesn't cause as severe disease? Carolyn. Yeah, I actually kind of I think that's a really fantastic approach. But as so as a funder and as someone completely outside, we're also really interested in looking outside of the bacterial world. You know, there is a, a whole ton of different resistance mechanisms out there, and we're only just beginning to scratch the surface with understanding bacteria. But yeah, I was talking about this just yesterday, and they were saying, well. You know, can we adapt these tools to look at viral resistance? You know, is there a way we can do this? And I think it's totally laudable to start looking outside of just those pathogens that cause human disease, but really also would be amazing to extend that fishing expedition 
further and start looking for different things in different pathogens. So that's a scary thought, but that's from the funder point of view. And the, the funding is actually one of the major, major difficulties with a lot of this work is it's very hard to get the funding and resources to even maintain these big databases. Even, I'm sure, even uh, Mike, Mike has had to fight internally within NCBI and NIH at times to keep keep like resources funding. And that's in a relatively well-funded organization compared to individual labs and groups that are running some like the ResFinder and CARD database. So there's a lot of ambition to extend these databases, but there's also caution because if you try and add all of antifungal resistance to your database, all of a sudden you've got to support that as well. And there are real world implications for not curating that data very well. And it potentially is going to be used somewhere and you know there can be a human cost, which is something in bioinformatics that we get in the pathogen side, but other parts, we just never even think about the problem, like you know, bugs in our code actually having a real world impact um, on someone's health. Um, but yeah, so it's maintaining these databases. So there's always, they're always keen for people to volunteer and contribute if anyone does have an interest in one area. And I know most of the databases will have expert curators in certain areas, certain gene families, certain uh, species that do help them contribute and co co uh, contribute to that curation of different mechanisms, et cetera. Anthony? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm making a really good point actually about the funding of databases, because I think um, we've always found this within the public health realm as a whole is that funding comes more easily to the kind of like the um, interesting research topics, but databases never really garner that, that much interest. But actually, they're the most crucial things that we, that, we, that, that we can have, really, is reliable, well-curated, frequently updated databases. And so I think it's still a dilemma is how do we, how do we find funding to fund those crucial databases on, on, on which not only research depends, but increasingly clinical action and surveillance will depend upon. So, so a big call out to funders, the big funders out there, please, please fund databases as, as well as like, you know, cool research. We really need to, and I think it's something we're totally aware. It's, it's absolutely essential that we really start to look into properly funding these kind of underpinning resources, because without them, you can't, you guys can't, you know, the, the interesting research can't happen. And more and more, you know, criticisms of grants that are interesting research is, your data is not, you know, you haven't got a good plan for the curating your data or you haven't good, got a good downstream data analysis plan. So really essential. And yes, I totally agree. And we are thinking about it, looking at it, trying to figure out a solution. Can I just tack on to that? Um, so it, it, it's really hard to get uh, sustainable funding for databases. It's even harder to get money for standards and ontologies and for curation that are absolutely critical to making sure what's in those databases are, are high quality. So yeah, so, so yeah, that, that part I think needs to be a little bit higher on people's radar as well. Absolutely, it's essential. And it is, it's a challenge because while databases and curation have massive impact, they're some of the hardest impacts to measure as well. So even if you know the funder, the funders are beholden, you know, the people, the people you know actually doing the programs are still beholden to governments and stuff like that. Over okay, what was the impact? How did this work? Is our money well spent? So it is. It's coming up with ways to measure that is a whole challenge in itself. And you can you can do it with citations, for example, but that has all its own problems and you know misses out the fact that you know you have a tool that's being used in every public health lab but is not being used for publications, for example. Um, okay, that's a, a fun problem. Okay, here's a database and curation related question. Now that we're on that topic, what is the difference between a virulence factor and an AMR gene? Why aren't AMR genes virulence factors? I'm looking at you, Emma. Oh, that, oh God. So <laughs> why aren't a, why aren't AMR genes virulence factors? Um, well, that's a good question. I think the, the topic of virulence uh, and the semantics around that are a, I think, and I think Kara mentioned this earlier, very contextual, right? So it depends on the bug. It depends on the environment. It depends on the, gen, the genetic determinants um and and how all those three things come together so what is a virulence factor versus a factor that affects virulence is i mean like i come at this from a, the fungal world and people get really polarized as to what 
what constitutes a virulence factor. So for us, I, I was working on Cryptococcus neoformans, and one of the, the three kind of canonical virulence factors is that it grows at 37 degrees. There are lots of things that grow at 37 degrees, and it doesn't mean that they are pathogens, right? So um, it's really contextual. And so I think ironing out the semantics for that is going to be really important. I know that's uh, one of the, <laughs> I know with the, in the, you know, our, our, we do an ontology called Gen Epio and we've worked with the, the MacArthur lab and the folks who uh, do all the card curation. And we have started, well, mostly driven by uh, the, the MacArthur lab, have started to try to put together a sort of proto virulence ontology to start wrangling these different things. But it, it depending on you, you're always going to upset somebody, uh, right? When you're starting to make these designations and classifications. So I can't answer that question for you right now. Um, but hopefully in the coming years, when funders start to recognize uh, the importance of standards and these kinds of semantics uh, for making these kinds of classifications and, and creating these kinds of knowledge hubs, um, you know, uh, I, I hopefully will be able to answer that a little bit better, but I'm going to wimp out and say, uh, I, I can't answer it now, but hopefully in the future. Ines? Yeah, I just wanted to jump in to say that you do have a database focused on virulence factors, the VFDB. I can drop the link in the chat. Uh, they do offer a definition of what a virulence factor is as something that aids this infection and or, or disease. Uh, so it's, it's a different mechanism to say like an antimicrobial resistance gene provides resistance to treatment. Uh, this one facilitates either the adhesion of a cell to um, a toxin. So they do provide a definition and there is a database that contains. How well is it maintained? I am not sure. It's been a while since I've used it, but there are resources there that are focused on, on the virulence part of it. And one thing is that they do separate by taxa. So for each species, they do have a list of what they consider the virulence factors. For example, my lab works a lot with pneumococcus. Uh, and one of the most uh, important virulence factor is actually its capsule, um, which is not really one gene, is a collection of genes and they can alter a lot. Um, but yeah, it's very dependent on what organism are you actually talking about. But there are resources out there. Yeah, definitely. That's a great point. But yeah, it's you do get into a messy territory where, you know, okay, if there's presence of a gene which makes this bacteria grow slightly better and grow faster, more robustly, which means it can grow fast enough to kind of deal with a low level of antibiotics being present in the system. Is that an AMR gene? Is that a virulence factor? Is that just bacterial metabolism? Like it, it's the classic fuzzy character categories that we always end up in life sciences. Yeah, Mark or Andrew, both of you. Well, when I have a student, a PhD student going into their viva, I always say to them, it's a doctor of philosophy that you're doing here. And you will get asked these questions in your viva. Uh, what is a virulence factor? And, and there are no simple answers to this. You know, it, it's, it's a very philosophical issue. So I think that, you know, there's a whole question of, you know, what is anything? You know, is philosophy 101? What do we mean by words? It's, it's a very deep issue, actually, but it's, it's a fun one to think about as well. So uh, just going back to virulence factors and all that, I know with, uh, with Tradus, we've done a lot of work where we've taken, you know, one bug, say E. coli, and then done different MICs of different, uh, different antibiotics. And then it's quite interesting to see which genes become essential and which ones are not as you stress it more and more and more. And it changes. So it's not like you have one set, you know, of genes that it's essential to live in a particular MIC of an, uh, of an antibiotic. It changes depending on the conditions because bacteria, you know, they're, they're fighting for their life and they, they'll do whatever it takes to, uh, to survive. So there can be different questions, there can be different answers in different uh, scenarios. Um. Yeah, okay, now that we've, we've done a bit of philosophy, there's a reason ontology is the field of philosophy and uh, something that we use as a tool in this area. Um, so there's some kind of like specific kind of questions and I was like, lots of people have lots of expertise doing these. Um, so first with the, I'm sorry about that, I'll close the door in a second. Um, you know, we have 
with these large databases now, and we have large amounts of bacterial genomes, especially, um, including many E. coli. What 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 do pan genomes, core genomes, accessory genomes have to do with resistance? How do they differ by different resistance mechanisms? I don't know if anyone wants to jump in and using the use of pan genomic methods in AMR. I suppose uh, I know a little bit about pan genomes. I don't know much about AMR. Um, but what you do see is you can see very clear patterns of uh, mobile genetic elements, uh, you know, jumping in and out when you look at a pan genome. And quite often those are the bits where you have the resistance genes. So obviously not point mutations, but uh, it's quite a, a good way to identify uh, not just say the, the AMR gene, but the structures around it and what other genes are there and what it's coming in on. Um, so you do have to look at, a, sometimes look at the bigger picture because these uh, AMR genes don't magically appear out of nowhere. I just say we have uh, another special guest joining the panel, uh, Duncan uh, McCannell from the CDC. So hello, Duncan. Hey all, sorry to be late. I have just a question back for you, Andrew, actually, on, on that point of pan genome. So it's, it's always been interesting to look at the accumulation of genes in the pan genome as we sequence more and more genomes. Has, do you know of any research which looks, has looked at the um, sort of the pan resistome and how that changes as you sequence more and more genomes? And, and how do we see um, species jumps occurring as a, a, within the sort of within that resist the, 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 the pan resistome as uh, over time as we as we see more and more bugs sort of getting together do, uh, in hospitals for example are we seeing more things jumping across the species barrier I, I've definitely seen stuff jumping species barrier and it's only because uh, we've gone and you know people like the FDA and CDC have gone and done a lot of, of uh, random surveillance around the world you know and sequencing every sample they seem to get and incidental samples that we find it. So our, our one case I, found, I remember was we had XDR typhi, uh, Samuel typhi, and then looking at the plasma that it was on, you know, looking back into databases, we found this is in the E. coli from cattle in, you know, some random place around the world. And there's one little gene difference, but, you know, it was more or less identical. And so this seemed to be the kind of ancestor and it's only by doing all the surveillance that we could actually see that, uh, which is quite interesting. And you wouldn't necessarily go and look for that if you're building pan genome, because you might be looking at like a well, species or, you know, a collection of uh, maybe subspecies, but uh, you wouldn't necessarily be going on a fishing expedition. And it's only using, you know, these kind of broad scanning tools that you can find this kind of stuff, which is super cool. You know, I found that using um, Zam Iqbal had a, a lovely tool. I can't remember what it was called. Uh, big, big, big Z, big Z by uh, fail, yeah. and uh, that was quite useful because you just bang in the plasma and then out comes the the answer, which is this came from cattle in a Uzi cola and cattle jumped into uh, humans, making crazy resistant uh, Samoa typhi, which is quite scary. Okay, okay, another what's yeah another kind of theme that's going to come up a few times is, and I think Duncan might have some input on this, I'm gonna put it on the spot, you know, revenge for being light. Um, how do you, you know, if you're looking at AMR across multiple different environments, sectors, you know, you're one health, you're looking at in the environment, in agriculture, in clinical settings, how do you choose which, how do you, like, how do you go about doing that molecular detection and surveillance? How do you choose which tool to use in different environments? Do you try one size fits all and do metagenomics for everything? And like, what were the kind of trade-offs and considerations between different detection methods and different environments? I think that's that's the question, isn't it? Um, I, I think, unfortunately, it's it's kind of like how everyone has a favorite tool. You know, many times the workflows that people put in place are um, built out of a sense of expediency and around a specific set of applications. Um, oftentimes the focus on that is fairly narrow and short term. You're not necessarily considering some of these broader environmental and one health implications. And, uh, you know, oftentimes 
you know, with the, just the sheer abundance of choice, I, I think it becomes a challenge when you actually try and adapt a workflow that has already been established for a certain range of pathogens in a certain context uh, to, to be able to handle multiple different scenarios. So that was a real non-answer, but you know, I, th I think that is the truth. I think uh, different groups approach it based on you know the approaches that they have, or the the tools that they're familiar with, or the you know best first best solution that they come across, uh, and then you know thoughts of how to actually incorporate that and harmonize that with other forms of testing, with functional susceptibility data, with other with clinical data streams, you know, other pieces of information. Um, you know, that tends to be uh, afterthought or post hoc, which is challenging. You know, I think that is changing now. I think these these kinds of conversations are absolutely critical uh, to talk about how these these approaches can be harmonized across multiple sectors, how different groups are approaching them, um, and um, you know how we can overall improve what we're doing. Yeah, that's great. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'll get that something then. Um, I say it depends is one of the answers. So, okay, you've you've come up with some way that you're doing surveillance across environments, or even even within one environment, just lots of different places. And you've got you've gone through this and you've done your genomics and got your AMR genes. How do you detect whether an AMR gene has actually undergone horizontal gene transfer or not? And I'll let anyone jump in on this one because I know pretty much everyone here has done something in related to HGT of AMR in some respect. Come on, you know you want to. Uh, maybe Hank can come in here. Now you're muted, Hank. Yeah, that's the so. Uh, can you repeat the question? Because I was reading the questions of the, the participants, so <laughs> that's, that's how, part how, of just, the problem. Yeah. How would we go about detecting whether an AMR gene has undergone horizontal gene transfer from genomic data? Who from the DOMIC data? Um, that's kind of, I, I would say that's kind of difficult. I mean, I, I'm just thinking about something like um, uh, most drug resistant, so me those mega plasmids that you find in, in, um, in Anthrobacteriaceae. And if you look hard, you will find them in many genera. It's not very, easy to, to uh, put any directionality on it. Like if you, we, we have lots and lots of data for, for some of those plasmids for salmonella because we have 150,000 genomes in the, or, or even more in the sequence read archive right now. But we have like um, only tens of genome sequenced for, for other genera that are maybe environmentally, not clinically important. So, and I think if you search for Anthrobacteriaceae, if you search hard, you will find that they share a lot and directionality is not really a big one. But I one thing you could potentially do is see if there is a case of recent horizontal gene transfer and try to transfer for instance, like uh, phylogenies of, of um, plasmids. But again, that's difficult because plasmids are usually like uh, basically a amalgam, like a, a composite of, of insertion sequences and your plasmid back, your functional plasmid backbone and et cetera. So that's also difficult. So directionality, it's a very interesting question, but I think it has to do with, with database sizes and the over-representation of, of certain uh, species, mainly clinically species. Yeah. Great. And as do you want to jump in on that? Yeah, I, I would say like one of the hardest things to, to know is context. Uh, a gene usually is going to be very well assembled. Um, but if it's surrounded by variant of by repeated regions, it, usually a plasmid mediated a resistant gene is, you, as Andrew said very well, you're going to need other technologies to actually have the context or where that gene is actually located. Um, and if, if you know the context, if you know, I know that this gene is surrounded by this 
repeated regions, this is most likely a plasmid mediated uh, resistance, it's still very hard to know where the, the direction of the, trans, uh, the transmission was. So I say like having a close look at what context those samples were collected. I remember, for example, while I was in Groningen, uh, there was an outbreak that was mediated by a plasmid. And it took a lot of work to know where the samples were collected from a patient or from the bed. Um, and sometimes, you know, it's very hard for bioinformaticians to sometimes be aware of the context of what samples are collected and in what conditions and what time. But I, alongside having the right technology uh, to get the context, the genomic context, having the right context of how the samples were collected um, and metadata on the timings it's really important to try to paint a picture of what is happening and still it, it won't be a hundred percent sure picture at least not in my experience Anthony. yeah i totally agree with um what both inez and hank have said um just another thing i suppose is um in the in the golden era in the future when we sequence a lot more if you're constantly sequencing your hospital environment, then you're able to then sort of track to see where these acquisitions and losses occur within, within the hospital. Obviously, it's much more difficult out in the community, but at least within the hospital, then you have a greater chance of looking, caring, comparing the chromosomal based phylogeny with the plasmid based or, or mobile genet uh, genetic element based phylogeny. And then and you can perhaps identify those events more easily by looking at those two together. Great. Okay, I think we might. I'm sorry. Okay. Oh, yeah. Just adding to that, I would say like having. I'm sorry. Something is really loud outside. Um, having the context of the One Health, you know, because transmission doesn't happen just in the clinical setting. Uh, transmission can happen in any sort of setting. So the the One Health approach to looking at resistance and transmissibility is incredibly important. And although it, it, at least a few years ago it was getting sort of good funding. You know, everyone could write a one health approach problem to figure out the resistance of something, something. Um, you know, things have changed, higher priorities have a reason, but it's still something that I feel like we should keep pushing forward, having, trying to have the most complete picture of, you know, it goes from food to people to health. Great. Okay, we're going to have a quick, we're going to now have, there's seven open questions. We're going to have a quick fire round. So just jump in immediately with the answer, and then Mark's going to give a couple of words at the end just to wrap up as we get towards the end. Okay, which tool would you recommend for compile a factor, especially using long and short read sequencing data? AMR and Finder. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'm supposed to jump in and say AMR Finder Plus, but we did do a good job with a whole bunch of Campbell factors. So unless something changes radically, uh, I don't think you'll miss things, but the other tools probably work pretty well too. And if you're interested in compile factor, I know Andrew's uh, podcast, Mike the Microwave Podcast, has done a whole episode about compiler factor genomics recently. Yeah, How we do, do we? Oh, sorry. <laughs> How best can we detect AMR genes from wastewater using qPCR? What CT to look out for? And how do we design primers as well? That's a very difficult task. <laughs> I mean, it's going to be totally degraded, you know, and uh, you're going to get bits and fragments and tiny little, you know, is it really AMR? I know some um, some people have done studies on, like, say, the number of vancomycin genes you find in wastewater and the distance from the local hospital, uh, which is quite shocking. And, you know, there is a correlation there, unfortunately. But uh, I think that that's a huge, difficult task. Are there any good resources anyone knows for the design of AMR uh, specific primers? I've done some work evaluating how well current primers work, which is terrifyingly badly. Many of the, even the UCAS panels are uh, not great. Um, I don't know if anyone's done any work in that area. So our the tool we did with uh, that we have Micro Biggie, which allows you, and it is biased towards the, you know the dominant organisms we've been talking about. We do have a way that if you, you can identify contigs that have those genes, and then you can get sequences with flanking regions around known genes. Um, and we built it for that specific purpose. So that is a way at least you can get a good handle on the flanking regions for developing primers. But then, of course, you have to go make sure that those primers actually work. So, I mean, that's, that's, you know, that's a way to at least um, 
And then that was actually by request from people who work on beta lactamases who said we want to do that kind of fishing expedition. So there is some of that, but of course you're limited by, we can only point you to sequences that we already have, um, but hopefully that will help you get some at least broader primers from, and this is just primer development. Great. Um, how do we interpret AMR genomic data, which indicates that the, the isolate would be resistant, but when we do phenotype, we find out it's susceptible. Is that organism sensitive or resistant? <laughs> Yep, therein lies the great mystery, I think. And there's there's the interesting research question is, okay, if it has this resistance gene, why isn't it resistant? Does that gene require a compensatory mutation to be effective that our model hasn't captured? That's where I think this real science comes in, the real interesting paper. You get to dig into that. Duncan, do you want to jump in? I, I just was going to add, you know, I, I think the truth, I mean, that, that's Schrodinger's genotype, right? Um, <laughs> resistance or not. But, it, you know, I think it really comes down to... Uh, Functional, functional results. I mean, clinically, what you're able to actually see in terms of phenotype, in terms of clinically, that, that, that's what matters more than the genotype. The genotype, there could be a lot of reasons that could explain what you're seeing, why the markers are present, and yet why uh, it isn't necessarily expressing in the way that you expect. Um, this is one reason, though, why, you know, not to put another plug in for NCBI, although they are fantastic, uh, why I think it is important, um, you know, the, the addition, their ability to now uh, host uh, functional susceptibility data alongside SRA records is a wonderful addition because it actually allows you to tag on that phenotypic uh, information about the isolate in addition to the, the raw sequence from the genotype. Yeah, as I say, genomes, genomes are our capacity, not phenotype. There's always going to be a disconnect between the two. Um, so I don't think uh, there's a question in the chat. AMR genomics is not going to entirely replace bench work. It's a tool that assists bench work. It can guide bench work to more interesting questions and interesting problems, but it's they are they are mutually complementary. They don't one doesn't replace the other. Um, which tool would be recommended most for would for TB using short reads? Okay, I think I have to say that TB profiler, which I featured in my presentation, I think it works for short reads. Uh, so it would be at least my first step. I, I know that the database is very targeted and incomprehensible for TB resistance. Uh, so I'll, I'll pop the link in the chat. Um, and I would start there at least. There's also Microbe as well, which is similar, similar process. And both are supported by harmonization as of this week. Um, so you can, you, you can use and compare across tools. Uh, anyone, okay. Um, what are the limitations you see to bait capture and targeted capture of AMR for metagenomics? Okay, maybe I can jump on this one as well. Um, okay, I would say like, this is true. If you do just random shotgun sequencing on metagenomics, you'll only know what you'll know. But a database with AMR is a lot more comprehensive that demand how many primers you can um, create and implement in a multiplex in a simple step. So I would say that you will still going to be very limited on, a, on how many AMR genes. So if you're very interested in, in a particular resistance, I would say it's it's much cheaper, it's very sensitive, and it's, it's, it's wise. But if you want to have a global picture, uh, I, will, I would say shotgun sequencing is still you know, the best. You'll be biased with what you have on your databases, um, but it, not as much as you would be if you try to do a PCR panel for it. Yeah, you're, you're bringing those a priori biases in your design for the baits to your metagenomic experiment, which can be great. It can get, if you have a good idea of what you're gonna expect to find, that can be a great way to improve that data and target it a bit more. But yeah, you can lose. You can also lose things you weren't expecting. Um, by, okay, last question, 62 questions. We got through them all. Buying a small sequencer, such as a min-ion for clinical microbiology applications. So detection, AMR detection, outbreak detection. What are the kind of pros and cons? Well, don't forget about the service cup, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, they, they can be expensive to run and to get people trained up on them but they are good for, uh, for quick analyses. But I would say buy a min-ion, you know, why, why go with uh, 
you know, something where you must run a particular batch size to get a cost effective uh, number of samples through it. If you have a miniline, you can, you know, do a few samples, of wash flow cell, do it again. Off you yep. go. Okay, there are some questions that have emerged since I overly got over ambitious about saying we got to the end of the question, but I think as we're getting close to the end of time, uh, Mark wanted to kind of have a few words to wrap up. So I'm going to pass over to him now. And I'll try and answer in the questions. Great. Well, thank you. Uh, and thanks for indulging an old man on a Friday. Uh, most people who know me know I'm quite outspoken, but I actually do have an idealistic and sentimental side. I want to just step back a bit from what you've been doing today. And I'm just going to share some slides with you now. Um, let me just see if I can get this to work. Here we are. And optimize that and share. So, um, many of you have been dealing with the details of issues today, and a lot of people are going to have questions that they haven't had quite answered. But I always like going back to this quote from uh, Plutarch. Um, one of the ancient great Greek scholars, who said, a mind is not a vessel to be filled, but a fire to be kindled. And I'd hope that what we've done today is actually get people excited about the potential of bioinformatics in AMR research, and um, that you'll go away and want to know more about this and learn more about this. But uh, the other thing that um, came, I came across a couple of years ago um, was... Uh, 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 looking afresh at an old saying about the internet, which is that distance is dead. But basically, bioinformatics can be done anywhere. Um, and this struck me when I visited Palestine a few years ago and came across this initiative in Gaza, where people were learning to code in Gaza and were actually making good use of their skills in an environment where it's very difficult to, to get anything much uh, done economically or, or, or be productive. Um, and I'm just going to share with you a, a young lady uh, speaking about her experiences there, which I think can be generalised because today we've had uh, 58 countries, uh, people from 58 countries participating. Uh, we've had participation from every continent on the planet apart from Antarctica uh, in this workshop. And let me just share with you something which I think is maybe seen as particular to Gaza, but I think is actually universal. صراحة أنا حاولت <تصفيق> أنا حاولت إني ألاقي وظيفة في أماكن تانية بس وضع البلد كتير صعب حاليا وفرص العمل يعني يعني ممكن نقول إنه خمسين من خمسين حد ممكن اثنين أو ثلاثة بيشتغلوا بشكل ثابت والباقي بيشتغل بشكل معقد وال وجزء منهم برضو ما بيشتغل بيحاول وهي هاد من ضمن الأسباب اللي خلتني أرجع للبرمجة من تاني إنه أنا أريد درس هندسة حاسوب وكنت بفكر إني أشتغل بإشي تاني غير مجالي فلما لقيت إنه سوق العمل مش موفر لي أي وظيفة فرجعت تاني للبرمجة وبتخيل إن أنا بقدر أشتغل في في بيتي وبقدر ألاقي وظيفة من أي مكان لو كنت أنا بعرف منيح كتير اللي هو السوفتوير سكيلز وإن أنا عندي ال هي إن أنا قوية في مجالي ممكن أقدم على أي موقع وأحصل على وظيفة بسهولة. And let me share some knowledge, some wisdom from a friend of mine from from the Gambia who we interviewed recently. So when I always tell people when you're looking um, for the next big thing in what you do with your life. You actually look what would impact um, you, your surrounding, the society, and the world. And at this moment, I don't think you need to be blind to understand that if you are in the field of microbiology with a bioinformatics um, um, knowledge and with um, doing, being able to do sequence, you have a job for uh, quite a few years. You are in demand. And so, if you, I mean, if somebody is not convincing you enough, is that there is a niche. There is a niche and it needs to be filled by people like you. So you should be um, actually giving your little finger to make sure that you join, you get a program where you'll be able to combine all of this, what I call future, future as in now, that will give you a niche 
for you to be able to apply, you would have um, influences in terms of um, public health response, influence in terms of how people do with outbreaks we're gonna get. And especially in our region, um, we they, we just, after this one, we'll expect, there's all, we're talking about Marburg, we're talking about uh, Ebola coming back. So they is so important to have microbiologists, very trained microbiologists, in more modern techniques that's sequencing, bioinformatics, um, to be able to deal with this problem. So you could be one of them. And then I'd like to just leave you with a quotation from my own country, from jo Joseph Priestley, who was a member of the, the Lunar Society of Birmingham, uh, which was a group of learned men, included industrialists, people who set up the modern world. And what he pointed out was that they were all united by a common love of science, which they felt sufficient to bring together persons of all distinction, Christians, Jews, Muslims and heathens, monarchists and Republicans. And I think that that is, uh, to me, that is one of the, the great pluses of what we've done today uh, in bringing people together to look at this. And it's not just a common love of science, we're addressing a common problem that faces the whole planet. So with that, I'll shut up with my sentimental wittering and leave you to it. Great, thanks very much, Mark. That was a nice, really nice uh, roundup. Um, so that's us. That's us at time. Um, as I say, uh, if you need a certificate and and or want to give any feedback for things today, please uh, follow the link uh, that Lisa posted in the chat. We'll also probably send it out by possibly send it out by email, uh, as well as notice when we've got all the recordings up and edited and PDFs of the slides, uh, as well as a link to that. Uh, repository with the training exercise being found in it. So I'd just like to thank again all the panelists and all the speakers that took time out of their day to come and put, help put this together and uh, participate in this. And I hope to see you all in probably and hopefully a future workshop because it clear, it's clear we have a scope for an entire workshop on horizontal gene transfer and on metagenomics just from questions and points today. Possibly one entire one on phenotype from AMR genomics. So plenty of opportunities in the future. Okay. Thank you all very much. Have a great day, everyone. Enjoy Thank your Friday. You.